and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Ocean TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I am Kevin Wilt. And on today's show, we've got a really great interview with TV and film composer Jeff Beal. We're going to look at a couple headlines and we're going to talk about what we've been listening to. And maybe Kevin even has time for a shameless plug. I do have a shameless plug. Okay. So we'll save that the best for last. Yes. (laughs) Better than the Jeff Beal interview. (laughs) <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right there's a priority to everything and jeff beal is second and kevin's shameless plug is first and jeff beal <laughs> I, has I, shameless... I am not the person saying these things by the way just for the record jeff beal had shameless plugs too as you will find out jeff soon. beal's allowed to have shameless plugs i think uh, no jeff really unlike you guys questions. jeff actually has shame though that's, well that's also true and also real things to plug so true uh, yeah we we okay. have like sort of real things, but anyway, kind, um, kind of. it's a it's a fun thing I have to plug. Anyway, are, are okay, we going to do a show? Are we going to start the show now? Let's do show. <clears throat> yes, yes. I thought we were starting it. Okay. Oh. Um. So a couple headlines. Alan Silvestri scores the new show Cosmos on Fox. Uh, is sort of a pickup of the well Neil deGrasse Tyson's hosting. It's kind of a pickup of the old Carl Sagan show and kind of a reimagining of it. Yeah. Um, so while he's busy with that one, Kevin, tell us what he won't be busy with. Uh, he will not be scoring the Avengers sequel, The Age of Ultron, which is kind of unfortunate. I, you know, when, when that score had come out a couple of years ago, I think we both pointed to it as, as maybe one of the better Marvel ones. But it, the, the Avengers Age of Ultron will be now be scored by Brian Tyler, who okay. just scored Iron Man 3, you know, less, mm-hmm. less than a year ago or, or whenever it was. I'll give a quick shout out to Brian Tyler, um, and I want to say that uh, after his score for Thor 2, which is loud and kind of, um, it sort of fills the needs of like a loud superhero action movie, and so it's it's serviceable, um, but uh, he writes the new intro music for Marvel, so when you see the new Marvel Studios and they start flipping the pages of comic books, yeah. that little 30 second intro is Brian Tyler's as, as well. And, it, and after seeing Captain America 2, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, they're now using the Brian Tyler intro on all the Marvel movies, and I love it. I mean, it just sort of gets you kind of pumped. Like, I think I'm about yeah. ready to see a really fun movie, and it's right there. It's like it, you, you, it's musically, you have the popcorn and you, you, the, the soda, and you're ready to drink, and it's yeah. awesome. So I, I, I really love it. That. That's cool. Good job, Brian. Um, let's see. Howard Shore is going to have three world premieres in Ireland. Kevin, what are those three world yeah, premieres? Um, let's uh, you know I don't remember specifically what they are, but these are concert pieces. So let me see if I can look it up very quickly from the article we will have posted. Um, da, 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 three Irish premieres: yeah. uh, his fanfare for organ and brass, selections from seven pieces for chamber or- chamber orchestra, and uh, mythic gardens concerto for cello and orchestra. All sound like actually kind of interesting pieces. I would like to be at that concert, except I'm not going to be in Ireland. But if you are, you'd like to be in Ireland too, though, right? It would be nice to be in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to be there, we will have the uh, the link to that article up on our website at soundnotion.tv/sap, so you can go see it, even though we can't. And you can also read the link whether you're in Ireland or not. So there's That's that. True. That's true. <laughs> um, for any fans out there of Clint Mansell or uh, Mika Levy. Uh, they both have respective scores coming up. Of course, uh, Clint Mansell's is for the Noah movie by Darren Aronofsky that's already out in theaters. Um, and then Mika Levy's score is to the uh, the film Under the Skin. I believe that stars Scarlett Johansson. Um, and Slash Film just recently had uh, kind of a preview of both scores. And so we've got the link to that, and you'll be able to check out both those scores. Of course, now probably Mansell's. You can hear it in theaters. Uh, and maybe even uh, no, I believe you can purchase that one now. So it is it is out. <clears throat> um, and then uh, on a side note, there was a preview of the Amazing Spider-Man Two by Hans Zimmer, and it was put up and within the same day uh, taken down. So that's why we're not mm. bothering to post that one. But I did notice it. It's worth noting. But there's nothing really to go to unless some other person uh, did like an extra alternative bootleg upload or something. Um, but I have not had time to check. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so if you want to, then please feel free. And if you find it, write us back and we'll post it on our next episode. Um, By which point it will probably be taken down again. Uh, <laughs> right. Now, speaking of Hans Zimmer, Kevin, I want you to introduce this next one because you had a kind of sure. a funny little thread on Facebook 
Well, yeah, I got a little bit snarky with it on Facebook. But um, there's an article that I found on this website. This is express.co.uk. Um, it mentions that Christopher Hans Zimmer is, of course, scoring the next Christopher Nolan movie, Interstellar. Um, and in this article, Christopher Nolan mentions that he he basically gave the film to Hans Zimmer as as an assignment with very few details. So Hans Zimmer didn't really know the plot of the film. He Christopher Nolan really just wanted him to base the score on this kind of little impression that that he gave him, which is really interesting. It's been interesting to see how that working relationship has changed a little bit. Um, one of the things I mentioned in that snarky comment that I made on Facebook um, is going back to Inception. Uh, Hans Zimmer didn't really, he, he sort of scored the film before it was edited. So music was added to the edited film as opposed to scored to the edited film. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that, that creative separation between score and film, it kind of went one step further with this in that the composer didn't even have the full details of the plot to, to score to as a, let alone a, a finished film. It'll, it'll be interesting to see how that, that kind of turns out. We'll have a link uh, to the article, of course, up on our website, and you can you can read it for yourself. Um, so there you go. Uh, okay. We have a couple events that we kind of want to mention um, at the end of what the end of next month, I guess. The New York Philharmonic is going to be doing an all Pixar concert conducted by David Newman, um, which will be really kind of interesting. This will be May first, second, first, second, and third. So if you are in New York and are looking for some sort of film music concert, you certainly have that. Um, in June, the Detroit Symphony will be having a, a benefit concert uh, conducted of John, John Williams music, conducted by John Williams and hosted by Steven Spielberg, which for the oh. Detroit Symphony is, is a huge event. And tickets go on sale tomorrow morning. Uh, and, and the Detroit Symphony has kind of been having fun with this. They are doing a, uh, basically camp out in front of orchestra hall for people who are lining up tonight to get tickets. First thing in the morning, they're going to have all sorts of games and, and prizes. And I think at like eight o'clock tomorrow morning, they have, it's, I'm not making this up like the great lakes region, something, something, um, legion of stormtroopers are going to have some, some people dressed up as star Wars characters showing up, to uh, kind of hang out with the people hanging out front and, and things like that. Um, so that could be kind of cool, but all of it is really about leading up to this um, big John Williams, Steven Spielberg concert that they are having in June, which I'm sure will be a, a tough ticket to get, but I'm sure it'll be a great concert as well. Well, I plan on getting a ticket, but I'm not going to wait in line and I'm not going to dress up. I'm just going to look if, if, if I were still in Michigan, I would certainly be clamoring to get a ticket. Unfortunately, I won't be there, so. But I fortunately, you live in Miami. That's true. Fortunately, I'm in South Florida, which is not a terrible place to be. In fact, it's quite. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll I'll write back after I've seen the concert and let you yeah. know how it was. Uh, okay. So. And I'll, um, I'll just respond about, back to what? whatever you write with my picture of me standing with John Williams. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, what we've been listening to this week, uh, I just want to jump right in. I did finally have a chance to check out uh, Django Unchained, Tarantino's movie. Um, I I want to spend more time talking about it because it is very much a kind of Ennio Morricone hodgepodge. But uh, we don't have a ton of time to spend on it. But it was kind of awful in some ways. I mean, the way the music's used, it's just dumped in like one big colossal, big budget temp track movie that's kind of what it is except it's all Ennio Morricone's music and it's just liberally used by Quentin Tarantino wherever he wants and and forever how, however long but then all of a sudden if that's not jarring enough then there's like uh Jim Croce and even some like RZA or RZA or Wu-Tang music that's just worked in in other places and that's about 10 times more jarring since it's supposed to be a spaghetti western so all the sounds you're used to hearing in a spaghetti western are there, plus like modern sounds, which you don't anticipate, which do take you out of the movie quite a bit. But anyway, um, the worst offense was probably 
when they included a bit of Verdi's Requiem, and I think it's the either the I think it's the DS Ray, uh, and it's big and it's loud and it's used in a lot of movies, most notably Battle Royale. But in the end credits, it said Verdi's Requiem, and then it said. Uh, the music was uh, composed, conducted, and arranged by, and then it listed the Japanese composer's name from Battle Royale. But it's not composed <laughs> by that guy. It's composed Whoops. by Verity. He just arranged it because they lifted it straight off the soundtrack to Battle Royale and just yeah. plastered it in the movie, like, again, like a temp track. But anyway, there was a Jerry Goldsmith track in there as well. It was just, it was just all over the place. But I did kind of enjoy the movie, but it is sort of... Uh, Tarantino just kind of doing what Tarantino does. Anyway, moving on, I saw Captain America 2, The Winter yep. Soldier, scored by Henry Jackman. Um, Kevin, did you notice the Alan Silvestri theme at the very beginning? I did. And, and you know, I was glad it was there, and, and I was yeah. selfishly hoping it would it would be there more, just like it was in the first movie. But as the movie unfolded, you realize it's a very, very different film from the first Captain America Oh yeah, which is set in the 1940s, where that kind of score is more appropriate. And in this film, which is you know present day and it's much more contemporary, like political thriller kind of thing, that it, as much as I would have liked to have it in there more, it, it I think it makes a lot of sense for it not to be in there. Right. So it, I think it was nice that there was the nod to it at the beginning, and and maybe that was probably the best use of it. In fact, the nod itself was like a quote of the entire theme, which was nice. More or it less, yeah. Wasn't, it wasn't like a quick couple notes or like a bar or two. It was it played out all the way. But when um, I don't want to say anything else more about the movie because it was really a lot of fun and, and great, pa- greatly paced, um, great action scenes. And um, my memory of it was that it all came together. Like I didn't have a chance to isolate the music and listen to it, but the music, the stunts. The, I mean, everything came together really, really well. But at the beginning, there is like space that the filmmakers kind of carved out so that the music could play in its entirety. And it yeah. just kind of like contributes to the scene. And not, there's not a lot of tension in that scene. Um, and it's enjoyable. And one reason is because it's quoting the original tune. So that was cool. Um, some other things. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a movie called Flesh and Blood from 1985-86 that Paul Verhoeven made. It's kind of a um, sandals and sword epic, um, but very. it's very, like, it's rough, let me tell you. Um, R-rated <laughs> to the T. But I wanted to see it because uh, Basil Polidorus scored it, and he had just come off of Conan, and I, I mean, I picked up the score, and I listened to it, and it's it's kind of like Conan, but it is really sort of a different, it's a different animal, and um, and it works well in the film. It does help, help definitely help set the mood and the time period, and kind of get that across. Uh, I've enjoyed. I know. I know this is bad, but the Meteor Man is a is a superhero movie. Um, but w- before superhero movies had finally gotten figured out, and so it was probably kind of corny. And I've never seen it, but the score by Cliff Eidelman is actually really charming. It's a lot of fun, um, and you can hear like Back to the Future and Star Wars inspirations in it. But it is still a lot of fun. And then I I did. We talk about it so much. We talk about Sherlock from BBC that I finally owned up and just bought the CD for series three and I've really enjoyed it. So, uh, again, kudos and hats off to David Arnold and Michael Price. I enjoy y'all's notes that you put together. Thank you. Those are some yep. nice notes. Yeah. What so you I've, been- um, I've been checking out Alan Silvestri's score to cosmos, which that, that whole series has been really great because it does have a very, uh, cinematic, <clears throat> expensive, quality to it and and so to hire a really big name composer like that um and and for the music to have that same kind of role is really nice it works really well um i've mentioned over the past i don't know six months a couple of times conrad pope's score to tim's vermeer the the docu- documentary uh the film itself finally came to town where i am because it's kind of been moving all around all over the place got a chance to see it really really great film really really interesting uh, just to those of you who are listeners who are uh, composers or creative types of, of any sort, uh, I, if you get a chance to see it, I highly recommend you go see it. It doesn't deal so much with the creative process as much as it deals with um, really the perseverance of, of completing uh, a project, whether it's a painting or, or whatever. That To me, that was really the most fascinating aspect of, of what... 
Tim uh, in this film was trying to do and just how painstaking it was, was really, really fascinating. Um, Bill, as you had mentioned, you, we both kind of saw uh, Captain America 2. And it, I had said a couple months ago, I think that'd be really nice for Henry Jackman to actually get one of these big action movies. And I thought he did a really nice job with it. The other film that I've seen recently that the score kind of um, blew me away was uh, Wes Anderson's The Grand Budapest Hotel. Now, going in, it, it hadn't occurred to me who was composing this score. Um, and it was really fun and really kind of light. And, and Ray Fiennes, who is the main character, is incredibly funny, which is not something you consider when you think of Ray Fiennes. You just think he's scary. But he's really funny in this movie. Um, but when the credits were rolling at the end, and this film had a great end title music, by the way, and Alexander Desplat came up. I was really kind of knocked out. I've I've sort of been late to the Alexander Desplat bandwagon. Um, this this was for me really the first score of his that I thought, man, this guy this guy is a a film composer chameleon just as much as anybody else mm-hmm. because this this was a score um, written for a whole orchestra of kind of Eastern European Russian instruments and it's again it's fun it's fun and it's light but there's a lot of authenticity to it um it's really great and and, and, and you should check it out like i said this this kind of put me on the the display bandwagon um that everyone else seems to be on and i'm kind of happy that it did okay that's cool uh, a couple quick new releases that i want to talk about a uh, friend of the show bruce broughton had a great score for young Sherlock Holmes from back in like 1986, 85, 86. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a movie that was produced by Steven Spielberg. Had one of the first uses of computer genera- generate, generated, can't believe it, generated imagery, uh, so CGI, um, and was uh, just a really great film. And it, it predated all this uh, prequel, or it prequeled all the prequel stuff. I guess. So anyway, uh, now the score has finally come out. It's available. Two CDs. Uh, Psycho 2, which is Jerry Goldsmith picking up the reins after Bernard Herrmann's famous score for the first Psycho movie. And then Jade, the 90s uh, sort of cop thriller with uh, David Caruso and Linda Fiorentino. Uh, those three are all out. And Jade is uh, – the music is written by James Horner. So Young Sherlock Holmes, uh, two CD, a Psycho 2 and Jade are all available now. And then as I mentioned later in the interview, I do believe the score for Noah is out uh, as well, and that's for the Darren Aronofsky film with the music composed by Clint Mansell. Um, So uh, that will take care of the uh, new releases that are currently out and available. All right, we're excited to have Jeff Beal join us today on our show. A couple quick credits uh, that Jeff has done, or before I even go into that, I just want to give a quick background of his career. Started out on the East Coast and has been working in media and scoring for about the last 25 years, and after a few years on the East Coast, then moved to the West Coast uh, in San Francisco, and then for about the last 20 years down in Southern California and in and around Los Angeles. Jeff's uh, main credits will include a lot of popular shows that probably our listeners have heard of or are fans of already, like Monk, for example, House of Betty. Uh, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm just opposed <laughs> to titles. House of Betty, right, that's a new show. <laughs> that's um, so, ugly so Betty, weird. I meant to say. Um, and then uh, the HBO shows Rome and uh, Carnival. <clears throat> but most famously, and as we'll probably talk about at great length, um, and most recently would be House of Cards. But also Jeff's worked in film with uh, movies like the Western Appaloosa and um, a lot of documentaries, one being the Pixar story. But most recently, again, and probably most well known would be the documentary Blackfish. So uh, without further ado, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Streamers and Punches. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for having me. And you had mentioned right before the show that um, you're going to take a nap right after this to help <laughs> jet lag. So, again, thank you for the pre-jet lag nap interview. Yes. And so we'll we'll make all the questions very direct, and hopefully you won't have to think too hard and and burn mental energy too much answering oh, it's them. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, speaking of, of the House of Cards that we mentioned, I did want to just uh, jump right into that. Like, how did you get involved with that show? Just sort of a – a very general approach. Yeah, well, I had done, I, I was a fan of David Fincher's for a long time. 
Uh, and around the time I was doing Rome for HBO, um, I got hired by David to score a commercial. You know, David got a start in first in visual effects and then doing music videos and commercials, which he still does some work in. Um, he's a great commercial director as well as a feature director. And he hired me for a commercial. It was a cell phone. And um, so, of course, thrilled to meet him and, and sort of kept in touch with him over the years. And when I saw this show was coming up, um, uh, having finished Rome and, and, and thinking this might be a good fit for us, I actually emailed him. And I said, hey, you know, just would love to send you some music for this, throw my hat in the ring. He said, sure, send me some stuff. So mm -hmm. I put a reel together, sent him some music, and then about a year went by. And then finally, out of the blue, I got this call to come. He called me, and we, we got together, and that was it. All away we went. So um, it was it was really nice. I mean, I think um, he he says a story. He actually this is a good good advice for young composers too. He he he's later said after working with me on the commercial, he went to M website and listened to all the different types of music I I did. And and um, you never know who's lurking or or checking your stuff out. But it is nice that we have you know. And I, I'm I'm old enough that that we didn't have that in, earlier in my career where you could sort of have a public face where you, all your work is you know that you, the work that you want to show at least would be available to other people and then go sort of check out uh, what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, uh, Kevin, you had a question that you were. Yeah, and this sticking with with House of Cards for a second. Um, can you talk a little bit about the logistics of working on a show like this? Because it's not one episode a week, both from from a, a working standpoint and from a creative standpoint. That this isn't a show where uh, viewers are going to hear your music and then have a week and then hear more of your music. They're potentially watching episodes back to back, and some of the challenges that that brings. Yeah, and I think it's creatively, it's it's actually been quite an opportunity for me. Um, the whole back to back thing. I mean, we sort of in the back of our, we sort of knew it. We thought about that when we were doing this first season. Um, you know, in fact, I remember spotting the first couple episodes. We were talking about the music that was going to begin episode two, and our editor said, "Well, we hope that people will be streaming on Netflix and they'll finish episode one. They'll go right back into mm -hmm. that." And his his reason for making that point was that you know people there was the good chance that people were going to watch this as a long movie or over a series of nights or as some people I know in a day, which just seems insane to me. But you could watch <laughs> it in a. I had just met somebody, a composer buddy of mine. I was on a panel yesterday with um, Trevor Morris, wonderful composer. He actually told me I watched the whole thing in two days. I mean, both seasons in two days. I mean, this guy was like, wow. I was I was impressed, you know. But um, stamina. Stamina yeah. <laughs> is right. This, you know, I don't know how much coffee he had, but he was he was into it. <laughs> um, but the the funny thing is, you know, it's not unlike you know working on a cable show where the deadlines are not quite as severe as a week to week show network show. So the that workflow I knew, but this whole idea of knowing, especially going into season two, that that you were really writing much more of like a long form movie as opposed mm -hmm. to an episodic week to week sort of show was was. It's it's a lot of fun for me because I think it's it provides you know it I, I'm really into the sort of the connections music makes um, over time for for an audience I do it I try to do it in my films and in a, and in a long form long movie or long episodic show you have an you have bigger arcs you know you have longer story arcs you have this sense of you know the first act of a movie takes place in 30 minutes the first fact. The first act of a House of Cards season is maybe three or four hours. You know, the, the third act of an, a third act of a movie is the last 30, 40 minutes. The third act of a House of Cards season is maybe the last three episodes. Mm -hmm. So it's just a much longer canvas to paint on. You know, in terms of um, the opportunities to sort of develop ideas, develop themes, and to to answer your question more specifically, to, to, to try to create those connections, not that an, a listener will, a viewer will say, oh, yeah, that reminds me of this or that. You know, it's, it's all sort of, you know, below the cognitive surface. But the idea that those connections exist and that they, they enhance the sort of the feeling of the world is really, really fun to do uh, musically. Okay. We, I was reading an article, I think maybe a couple of months ago, talking about this idea of people binge watching TV and, and some of the the issues that um, that means for composers. And, and one of the things, actually, a couple of things that were brought up were the idea of um, maybe using a theme too much. That if you have a week from episode to episode, and and you're using uh, recurring thematic material, whether it's the main title or within the context of the episode. 
that if someone is binge watching, maybe if you're reusing musical material, that starts to become a problem because now they're almost getting too much of it. And I'm wondering if any of that sort of played into that same thing you were just talking about. You know, uh, yes and no. I mean, I'll sort of, I'm sort of going to go hem and haw on my answer because, you know, I believe strongly in repetition as a device for, for, for reinforcing something with the viewers. So I've done that on, on almost every show I've done. You know, a theme, mm -hmm. if you write a great theme and it means something, there's no law against using it again in another episode of the series, possibly adapt. You always, when you bring something back, you adapt it, you got to work it into the timing. But mm -hmm. that, that reuse is, is, is meaningful. You know, it's interesting, though, because I'm a big fan. My wife and I are big fans of Downton Abbey. It's a wonderful show. But, uh, and I love the music. But, you know, I learned that, you know, for some reason, the way they do music in the UK, they do not, as, it's just like a part of their DNA. They do not record a lot of new music for each season of a series. And and I, and I remember my, you know, I felt this. And then I remember my, my teenager son walked in and goes, are they just using the same music over and over and over again? <laughs> so I guess my point is, and that's a crude example, and I'm sort of picking on something that feels, feels obvious to me, okay? Yeah. But the reason for saying that is that, you know, there's, it's, it's a feel thing. You know, you kind of have to know. You kind of have to step back and, and kind of test yourself a little bit, I think, and know when you've had enough of a good thing and just sort of get up to that sweet spot of, yeah, we love it, and we want to hear it again. To you, you, you've overdone it, and you and you feel like you sort of cheat your audience. I mean, if you just do that, I think too much, you end up cheating your audience. So, a good example of that, um, something that's been a fun surprise for me in doing season two of House of Cards, was that I, you know, the music is very related to the music of season one, but there wasn't a lot of tracking of cues from season one. In fact, hardly any cues. There was a what, couple really key themes that were brought back. But when I look back at what all the music I wrote for season two, and, and we're just hopefully, well, we're soon releasing the soundtrack, and it, I did another double CD because I felt I don't didn't want to make it long to be long, but I just felt like when I when I gathered together all the themes that were created for season two, I had another double CD collection. So it was fun to to feel like um, because the story evolved, and because we felt like you know Fincher had some other ideas about where the story, the, where the tone was going in the second season, it was a great opportunity to say, okay, let's let's keep keep spinning out the ideas, you know. Yeah, I wanted to uh, make a comment about the main title because uh, I remember throughout watching the first season, I wasn't able to binge in one day or anything like that, but I did I did see it in a, a pretty quick amount of time, but. One thing I liked about just the way you had set up the music was that you had a lot of different, um, well, just sort of sounds and layers, and there would be sort of little motives and things like that. And then eventually, um, a good bit into the main title, then you kind of get like a solo cello line that would kind of emerge. And one thing that I, I liked about it was that it wasn't immediate. It wasn't right away, and it wasn't right in your face. Um, Dave, our producer, has told us before how when he watches uh, like um, West Wing, just not because it's political also, but just because that's one of his favorite shows. He watches it over and over on Netflix. And and the main title of that one um, is very, like, kind of right out in the open. <clears throat> and I think Dave hates it now. I think that's the story. <laughs> right, Dave? Yeah, pretty um, much. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not that's about... That's a great oh. show, by the way. I love the West Wing. Right. Yeah. I think, the I think the main title gets a little wearing if you watch 80 of them. <laughs> I think that's the case, probably the case with any show. I mean... I, I was really nervous about our show for the same reason, because we have a pretty long main title sequence. Yeah. And, and I was actually nervous privately. I actually thought, in fact, I think there was even discussion at one point that are we always going to do this? It's basically a 96. Are we going to do this 90 second sequence each time? You know, and, and it was like, yeah, that's it. And I was like, part of me was like thrilled. And part of me was like, gosh, I hope people hang out for this. <laughs> I, so, I mean, the, the luxury of that time is that you, I did try, I do like, I like layers a lot. I mean, I've done it in a lot of my other scores. When you have no other things to play around with and there's no really sound effects, there's no dialogue in our main title sequence. So I was definitely conscious of, of putting a lot of stuff in there so that it would sort of hold up well over repeated listenings. Yeah. And another thing that, that's sort of fun about the way the show is structured, you know, is that the main title is sometimes it's the first thing you hear. Sometimes it comes out of a scene. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, more often than not, it comes out of a scene and it goes back into a scene. And part of the fun I have writing the score for each episode is I usually am scoring the show. I'm usually scoring the scene that goes into the main title. And I very, very, very um, deliberately create a bridge from the scene into the main title. And usually the main title then spills back out into the scene. So in, I'm just, uh, this is a long 
roundabout way of saying that unlike a, a separate cut where it's like all the music stops and then, okay, you're in that sequence, I think one of the things that does, it gives the... It, it, it gives you the feeling that the main the music for the main title is somehow part of the show. It's because it's connected in time and in musical arrangement to whatever you were just seeing. You don't feel like like everything just stopped. You feel like okay, and this is just now another part of the uh, experience, possibly. That's a very similar approach I've noticed uh, that uh, Bear McCrary takes on um, Walking Dead because. Yeah. It would it would kind of get you ramped up. It's like oh we're we're about to hear the main title music now, and then it would kind of well it's, since it's AMC I think that after the main title it would segue to commercial break. But yeah. um, thankfully yours doesn't. So yeah. um, it does. It it really does. It keeps it pulled together, and uh, it takes you right out of the intro into the main credits, and then right out of that back into the show. Um, yeah. But I mean visually the opening is you had that I don't know if it was fun for you to score that, but it just it's fun to watch because of the the time lapse photography, mm -hmm. um, particularly like when the the lions are kind of statues are kind of catching airplanes at night, and and then with the music and the different kind of uh, timbres and 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 lay again layers and things going on in the music, it's just a, a fantastic matchup. And um, and again, the more I listen to it, the more I I kind of dig to listen to other things going on in the music and to also watch other things in the footage. And it is just a it's. One of the things I've enjoyed about shows on HBO and Netflix is that they are a little bolder, I think, by giving 90 seconds, uh, which is, in fact, a very kind of old fashioned approach to TV. But I, I think it can still hold up. So I'm, I'm glad you guys took that approach. I wanted to ask, though, since trumpet is one of your instruments, was that a conscious decision right away to have uh, some solo trumpet lines in the main title? Um to, uh, it, and I don't know if you played it or if it was a buddy of yours uh, no. or just a, a studio musician. Um, was that a conscious decision right away? Like, oh, the trumpet is is sometimes synonymous with um, uh, sort of patriotism. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or there it is. I found it finally. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually, my trumpet's in the other room because I'm doing a gig next week in Los Angeles, a jazz gig. So I'm trying to get my chops back in shape. That was me playing. It was one of the last things I did. And, and, you know, when David and I first met, we were careful, like the kind of the initial conversation was, of course, House of Cards is, is sort of the antithesis of West Wing in terms of the tone. It's not, it's not this, it's not oh, this yeah. <laughs> idolized or optimistic Aaron Sorkin, which I love. And I love the, uh, Martin Sheen's portrayal and everything, but it was very much sort of like the Clinton hopeful, you know, this is House of Cards, which is, of course, adapted from a British show is much more about the dark sort of side of politics and it really is sort of Shakespeare layered onto politics so um, it's a much it's 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 really not as literally Washington the funny thing about the main title sequence is that it went through it was the script pages were slightly different but the basic the basic story of the main title sequence is what you see it's sort of like starting out in bright daylight and then darkness descends and you sort of see the nooks and crannies and grit and grain of what real Washington is but the beginning, when I saw that footage of, the, of these iconic um, things, you know, the Washington Monument and, and these cool close-ups, like you say, the lions and just all these cool things. There's even, there's even a shot of like a statue with a guy holding like a blue bugle, you know? Yeah. And, and after a certain point of, of working on this track and really building it up and building it up and building it up, I just kind of said, I just got this idea, you know, like before David came over for a meeting, I just... We got it, you know, I, I, and I purposely did not use hardly any trumpet in the score, especially in the first season. I used some in the second season. And I didn't, as a rule, I said, but, but in this one place, I said, wouldn't it be cool to kind of use the trumpet? Because it is, because the whole point of the, point of the sequence is that you're sort of taking the icon and doing something very strange with it. You know, it's like you start off with the thing that we all know, and then you sort of twist it, you know, dark and weird and, and, and sort of... Um, not not what what the usual perception is. So, it's you know I, I I'm hor horribly butchering this quote, but I think that not Nadia Boulanger said once, you know, never go out of your way to avoid the obvious, you know. And I love that because you know sometimes you can get into trouble um, thinking that you just have to completely reinvent the wheel, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason something works and something sticks. And and um, you know, I worked on the long, I think we, we, we kind of went back and forth, paring down the density of the lines. Some of the first few things I played were a little more improvisatory. And David said, no, not too jazzy. It should be just more like kind of straight and percussive. So, but I, I really like that aspect in the score. It gave us something, I think, that um, it gives a voice to the, to the main title. It gives sort of a, 
um, another dimension in the sound that you can't get from from the strings. Yeah, and you know, I think that that works really, really well too with just the logo, which is just the inverted American flag. It it really fits along the same lines. It's really that recognizable thing, but it lets you know that this is really a different a different take. And and I think yeah. that that trumpet work in that main title really fits that nicely. Yeah. Um, could could you talk a little bit about the post production schedule for this show? Since you don't have the staggered releases of these these episodes, how that changes your timeline as a composer? Yeah, I, I I'm thinking this is pretty typical for each season, but you know it tends to be a little little more generous in the beginning and then sort of speeds up towards the end. Especially in the beginning, it was that way because Fincher directed the first two episodes and we were really sort of finding our sound. So. I think I started writing on the, the first one maybe in mid-June, and we didn't really record those scores till I want to say, like the end of July, early August. So we had several weeks mm -hmm. in, in the process of doing that music to sort of find our way and, and, and get where we were going. Then, of course, after that, it, be, it, it got closer to what, what was maybe a cable show delivery schedule where I would typically have about two episodes every three weeks, maybe four weeks, depending on how quickly they were shooting. Um, and, and that tended to be the, the rhythm of it, you know. Um, I also, just because of budgetary reasons and because they were kind enough to give me a string section, um, I enabled to, to, afford, to, to afford that, I basically record the strings every two episodes. So I have to write ahead a little bit, um, but usually I'll, I'll work on two episodes over a course of maybe two weeks, maybe two and a half weeks. And then I'll then I'll record those strings. Usually, that first of those two will be all but locked, and I will send a preview of that score, and I'll do my notes on that. And then maybe the following week, I'll send a preview of the following score um, for the for the producers to to sort of put final touches on and then mm -hmm. ship it. You know. Um, I wanted to ask a moment ago when you referred to uh, creating the main title and and how you approach the different sounds and the, and is the trumpet going to be jazzy or more. I think the end result is kind of a very atmospheric, kind of in the distant approach. Um, so how hands-on was David Fincher, and would he kind of give ideas and then kind of let you do it? Or is he actually like a musical, or is he pretty good at communicating what he wants musically? Um, this is a two-parter. <laughs> and then once that was established, do all the other directors on the House of Cards episode just kind of leave you alone now that you've established the tone of the show? Or are they also like highly interactive about the music? Yeah, a little bit of both in terms. Of, I'm going to take the second question first, and that is, um, you know, there's certain directors who have come back on many episodes who have been in the mix, um, which has been fun for me. Um, the names that come to mind are James Foley, a wonderful director who did one of my favorite movies, Glenn, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, who was who was involved. Um, Carl Franklin, who did. Two episodes. He did the first two episodes in season two, and he did um, some key episodes in season one involving Peter Russo's character. I won't give any spoilers for front, people who haven't seen the show yet. I think it was 10 and 11. I know what happened. You know what happened. Okay. <laughs> wink, wink. Uh, but in general, especially in this, and it's going to change after these first two seasons, but in general, the fun, the part of the fun in getting now to question one is that David Fincher, yes, is incredibly musical. And he was very, and this is very typical for TV, you know, it's, you tend to work with one person throughout the course of a season. It's really important that you have a point person who's your sort of creative, collaborative sounding board who has heard all of your scores and also knows the, the, the arc of the whole aspect of what you're doing. And, and, and this was a new thing for David, but he was really, not only was the pilot, well, not only was sort of the pilot director, but this was sort of his baby. And he was really executive producer for both seasons one and seasons two. And, and that can mean many things. It could mean somebody's names on it, but David being David and so passionate and, and passionate about music, I was very thrilled that he, he was pretty much, especially in season one, the one that was giving me all the notes on music. Um, he, he's very precise and, and very, very attuned to sound, especially. Um, but I, one of the enjoyments of working with him is he knows when to step away, you know, and not, he doesn't over direct. And I really appreciate that. I mean, he likes to trust people and set them, set, going to set them, set them loose. And, and, you know, sometimes when you're working with somebody, you kind of know where that line might be where, oh, it's just going to, they're going to freak out if they hear this or that. And, you know, David is just so sophisticated musically, you know, so many types of music. I didn't, I never really felt like I even got close to that line where something would just totally 
freak him out. And that was actually fun for me because I felt like we were really free to be as creative and sort of us bold as we as we wanted to be with with whatever we were doing with music. I remember one of the funny one of the things we spent a lot of time sonically in the beginning was didn't have anything to do with the sound of the trumpet, which he sort of liked all from the beginning. Which the, actually, well, let me stop for a second. The sound of the trumpet is kind of funny because before doing House of Cards, I worked with Michael Mann on a short-lived but very quite interesting show for HBO called Luck. And uh, no, I horse horse show. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, Justin Hoffman. Yeah. And Michael, as he often does, has many composers. I was one of many composers, and I came in sort of midway through the run. And, and in his first meeting, he said, I don't have, like any horns, no wind, no wind instruments was the rule, you know. And I'm like sort of looking at this footage of this Dustin Hoffman character, and it was all guitars and acoustic guitars and ambient sort of Brian Eno and groove stuff and rock and roll. And I just was like banging my head against the wall. I was like, man, I got to do a little trumpet here. I just can't help it, you know? <laughs> so I, I just recorded a few trumpet things, and I'm thinking, like, he's going to hate this, but what the hell, you know? So yeah. I turned it in, and he loved it. You know, he actually called us in for this whole meeting and saying, like, this is the sound, this sort of weird. And it, what I did was, <laughs> because it was such a weird thing, you know, it was not, it wasn't a jazz score. It wasn't noirish. I actually had just was putting my horn through all these really weird plugins and long delays with phasing and just to kind of like have the sound of the trumpet be there, but sort of put a spin on it that didn't make it feel like it was too literal, you know? So that's kind of inspired the sound I used on House of Cards. But getting back to David, um, the sound that we really spent a lot of time on was the piano because there is a lot of solo piano in the score. And, and he was very attuned to not only the, the amount of reverb and the kind of reverb we used on it, but also the color of it. And this was kind of fun because um, he, he had a lot of great ideas about the piano, but I also learned in working on that that I guess on this was just shortly after he'd done the social network with, with Trent and Atticus, and there's a very cool little piano melody in there. You know, ding, ding, boom. You know, yeah. that, that, yeah. that, that is a single line. It's a very, and, and they spent, I guess they spent, you know, many, many times working on the sound of that. So, you know, it's kind of the nature of the beast with David. And it's fun when you work with somebody that hears everything and could be so specific about something that they feel like needs to be really defined. I mean, he's that way with picture too. He has such a great eye. I mean, um, he, he can look at a frame and that, that looks completely, you know, stable less and will say, no, you know, the camera's not, not locked down, you know, we'll digitally stable it, stabilize it and all this kind of stuff. Now we you mentioned a couple of minutes ago uh, about you know the Peter Russo character and certainly House of Cards, particularly season two, maybe even more than season one, has lots of very very surprising moments, and I'm wondering um, how how you handle a show that has that many unexpected things because oftentimes you hear composers talking about and maybe this is a more old fashioned take but music sort of being from the audience perspective and and certainly with that many surprises that that puts the audience in an awkward position sometimes. I, I think you're right. And, I, and the, the, the interesting thing about your question, which I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of project into that, which I think one of the things you're suggesting is that, you know, one of the first rules of film scoring is don't telegraph the story, you know, don't tell your mm -hmm. audience where things are going, right? Sure. And of course, when you're the composer and if you've either read a script or you've watched it once, you're already, you're already sort of scorched earth. You know what's going to happen, right? And the reason I bring up comedy is that comedy is actually a really great teacher in this. You, you know, there's an element of surprise in all drama, which, which when you surprise the audience, that's when, that's when you make someone laugh. And when you surprise the audience with something shocking, that's when you really kind of just go make them go, oh, crap, you know, something just <laughs> happened. Um, so you don't want to give all that away. You don't want to rob the audience of those moments. But the, the, old, the flip side of that, I'd say, is that uh, there is a way in which there is an, an inevitability in sort of built into some, a story. So um, I, like, I, I like the word sort of foreshadowing a, a little bit because that, that sort of lives in a little more of a literary gray area. Where mm -hmm. you, you don't want to give something away, but you also don't want the shock to feel like it came, like it was so unexpected or out of character that it didn't, that you couldn't, there wasn't a reason, there wasn't a rationality yeah. in terms of the character's actions, right, that could lead to that. So part of the fun and sort of the, the tightrope you walk in these situations is, is sort of serving up the situation and the character and making that um, uh, believable and true, I would say, 
but not getting ahead of that moment, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and and a lot a lot of the I mean it's funny I actually on the panel we did yesterday I was with Trevor Morris and uh, Blake Neely and, and uh, Blake was talking about when he sometimes when he worked with young composers they'd always be hitting everything right on the beat and sometimes he'd take one of their cues and just slide it back two seconds later and he and the composer would just go crazy like oh no and then they'd watch it go like hey that's really that works really good yeah <laughs> and it's one of these sort of intrinsic things you learn as a composer how music and the beats within a music and when i say beats i don't mean beats like we say in music i'm using that beats term as like a filmmaking term like you have dramatic beats and there's a way in which I, I pay a lot of attention to the actors when I'm when I'm working and to their performance, and there's a way in which I think if you let the actors lead and then just follow just along with music, that that, that you can really sort of create this sort of cohesion, hopefully mm-hmm. between the score and what's happening, so that music can be in there and 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 playing that scene and and dealing with it, but not making the audience feel like they're sort of being ramrodded, you know. Yeah. I think when the, I think what that that sense from an audience can come with the music is just sort of overwrought or overcomposed or if it's timed it's just it's just timed wrong this it's all about timing that's why i mentioned comedy it's comedy's the ultimate sort of timing teacher you know Mm -hmm. um i wanted to ask uh very quickly since we've been talking mostly about television but um when you approach documentaries um how is there a difference in your mind when you approach uh that versus um like dramatic projects or uh, do you try to stay out of the way more, or or is it really case by case? Yeah, well, well, it's funny because we we talked about your hometown, Flint, or near your you live near Flint, Michigan. We mentioned Michael Moore. As we gave a shout out to Michael Moore in the pre-show, and and um, you know when I look at the state of documentary filmmaking today, and I, I credit Michael Moore with some of this because I think there was a there was a there was a sort of new wave of documentary filmmaking that Michael and, and a lot of other directors sort of sort of brought to audiences' attention. And I mentioned him because his, some of his documentaries were some of the first to really become box office successful, you know, but there's a oh, lot yeah. of other ones that have done the same thing and Inconvenient Truth and all this sort of thing. But the, the interesting thing is that, um, you know, audiences have accepted a, a, a dramatic score in a documentary when it's done well, when, it's, when the music is well used. And that's been a lot of fun for me. You know, obviously when it's a real story, there's a certain amount of respect you have to have for that story and, 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 and sort of, I wouldn't say restraint, but, you know, respect. But to be honest with you, when I'm doing a, drama, when I'm doing a dramatic scripted thing, I try to have the same respect because even though it's, it's, it's all, even that suspended disbelief and it's fiction, for the, from the audience's point of view and from the composer's point of view, you're trying to sell it as reality. That's the whole point of a, a drama is to get lost in it and believe that these are really happening no matter how you know, implausible they may be. So, um, you know, documentary, I actually think in general, you know, documentary filmmaking right now, I mean, you know, I've had many films at Sundance and, and every time I go to the Sundance Film Festival, many times you can, I go around and see a ton of films and I'll, I'll feel, and a lot of people I'll feel, they go, they'll look around, they say, you know what, the coolest films here are the documentaries. So for whatever reason, there's just a lot of really great creativity happening right now in the documentary space. I, I think one, one reason, you know, I think this is, is I think when you look at sort of the disparaging state of, of the 24-hour news cycle and this insanity of sort of, you know, what, what we get for news now, I think in a lot of ways, documentary filmmakers have sort of stepped in where a good investigative journalism unit of a, of a major network used to do. They might, they'd produce special reports on something and really they would provide this sort of in-depth look at a story that you don't really get on the TV anymore. So uh, I think maybe some, that's, that's true too. When you look at a film like Blackfish or whatever, you know, that's, that's sort of a level of storytelling that you're not going to get from just a, you know, a three minute segment on, on wherever. Mm-hmm. Well, I did want to follow up on the Blackfish documentary that you just mentioned. Um, for any viewers that haven't seen it, but have read headlines in the last, I'd say, five years, I don't even know if it goes back that far, but the, the, there have been incidents reported where at SeaWorld, um, some of the killer whales would either attack or just kill outright the the trainers there. Um, I know that that documentary opens with that as the focus and then sort of broadens the scope to then kind of start talking about the treatment of the animals and I don't I don't think it's just only at SeaWorld or is it at water parks in general but it's mostly SeaWorld okay um but I want I did want to ask uh, Jeff was the involvement for that since you have done documentaries before was it okay this is another 
you know, it's another job. <laughs> and or was it? Uh, no, this was something I actually felt very strongly about. Um, and I just well, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, I think well, and, and to 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 sort of clarify that first point, one of the fascinating things which I didn't really know in Blackfish was that these attacks on trainers goes it's got like a 30 year history which actually there are some some parks pre sea world that you know that had same problems with 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 these amazing creatures um you know before while she was working on the film gabriella sent me one scene in the movie it's when a trainer ken is his name i believe gets dragged underwater by one of these and whales and orcas and um it's a it's an amazing it's a really riveting scene and I just saw that I saw that and she had tempted some of my music and she was sort of showing me what I was doing and one thing that struck me it's hard to hear my own music tempt into another movie because I know where it came from but I liked her choices and her cinematic sense of what music was doing for that scene but again getting back to that earlier thing we were talking about music in a documentary just watching it as a scene it was one of the most riveting pieces of filmmaking i'd ever i'd ever seen you know and, and it was funny i remember when we when we premiered at sundance i i i ran into somebody that seen the film and he said oh man i was like on the edge of my seat the last 45 minutes of that thing it was it was like more of a dramatic suspenseful experience i've had in any in any movie including dramatic movies in a long time so um, there was a sense it wasn't, you know, I, I guess in one on a very cynical level, you know, it's always just another job. I mean, we are just sort of chameleons, you know, we, part of what I love about what I do is I get to sort of visit a world and live in it for a while and be creative within it. Um, in the case of a documentary, um, a lot of times the, the financial, to be honest, is the financial aspect of that is not as great, mm -hmm. um, as a big budget movie. But mm -hmm. I'm honestly in a part of my career where a lot of these type of projects have come my way. And I really feel so happy because, you know, life is short. I mean, and I feel really I get invested. I mean, I feel very proud and very privileged to be telling some of these stories that I feel that have a social importance that is that is beyond, you know, getting paid. You know, uh, there's another one that's going to premiere that was at Sundance that's going to premiere on POV, I think, in June. Um, beautiful film uh, called When I Walk, which is directed by a friend of mine in New York, Jason De Silva, who has multiple sclerosis, and he's in a wheelchair. You know, I was diagnosed about seven years ago with MS, and I'm living with this uh, disease. And of course, you can imagine for me, working on that film was really special to me. And so, I hope people see it. It's a wonderful movie. Um, so, you know, there is a way in which, um, unlike a, a, um, a drama. Scripted thing, you know. I think when you're doing on documentary, if it's something you believe in, you care about, uh, that it that it can have a sort of uh, sort of a personal resonance that goes beyond just another job. Yeah. Well, okay. So my next question is going to swing the pendulum back to television a little bit, but um, uh, a lot of the work you've done it just has ended up this way. I mean, even when I was kind of stacking up credits. I recognize like Monk and Ugly Betty, House of Cards, Rome, and, and so on and so forth. You've done a lot of work in television, and it's it's pretty widely known that that is now this amazing medium uh, because of some of the projects that go through, like Breaking Bad and, well, even going back to The Sopranos or The Wire or Battlestar Galactica or now with um, uh, Mad Men and, and, and House of Cards, of course, uh, being through Netflix but still television um, – how does it feel to be in your position? Are you kind of sitting back and smiling like, oh, yeah, I knew it all along? <laughs> or, um, oh, yeah, I mean, has, how has it felt in a way? Because you, you are now um, kind of on – you're sort of riding the surfboard on the edge of this wave uh, with House of Cards. And I, the, the possibilities seem really positive and optimistic and endless. Um, have you thought about that or you're just like, no, I don't have time to think of it that way? Yeah, I I think I think well let me let me step back from me, the, the the personal just the the Jeff Beal part of it and just say in general in terms of what you were mentioning is I I really believe is our Skype connection getting a little bad I'll try to fix I that. I got you. Okay, good. Um maybe it's what I'm seeing coming back. So I really believe that we are living in a, this is a goal, and, it, and it's totally I feel incredibly lucky. But we when you look at around where the creativity is happening you know, the, the studios have sort of moved to the tentpole, big $200 million comic yeah. book franchise, which is fine. So I watch some of those movies. They're great, you know. Yeah. But 
when you look at the level of story playing, the acting talent, the writing talent, and the kind of stories that are being told now on both, you know, basic cable and premium cable and network TV, mm -hmm. it's incredible, really. I mean, the, what this, what what we have happening, it's really exciting. Unfortunately, there still is, there still is this thing like, oh, he's a TV composer. I mean, if there was one thing, you know, I wish that could go away was that there is. Unfortunately, there is. I think it's fast, sort of fading by the wayside, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I feel like in terms of where I've ended up, it's exactly the right place. You know, I did I did this movie Pollock, you know, in I think two thousand with Ed yeah. Harris, mm -hmm. and it was really important to me because it's a great movie, and I re it was the first movie I had where it, it was the first feature, real feature I had. But I also really got to show compositionally who I am. You know, it led, and I thought, oh, this is going to break my big feature career. But instead, really, out of that film, I, I got my relationship with HBO, which, in a way, when I look back on it in time and to well, where it's led me with House of Cards, I see, oh, that, that's, that's much more my home than, than probably doing a bunch of big action movies or big comic book movies. You know, I'm more of a, I'm more of a specific, artistic kind of storyteller. Musically, that's just kind of where I live, and I believe in that. You know, you can't, you can, you can wish for whatever, but we don't have a lot. Of, we don't have control over where a career goes. But I do believe that sort of karmically, that 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 your that your that your work finds the proper home. And I hope it does. I mean, I think that's when you do your best work is when you you sort of get linked with people you really have a good that that just sort of you have a. I call it finding your tribe. You know, it's when you sort of get in that groove with people that 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 you have a, a like-mindedness with mm -hmm. yeah and, and i did not mean to suggest that you are like a quote tv composer at the, at the beginning of the question um no not at all even of course the imdb bio is sort of has some little funny spots in there i'm sure they're unintentional but but one thing that i did mention was with the education you've had and the experience with east coast and west coast collaborations and jazz as well as concert music that um, you're just a composer, which I think was uh, kind of a situation Jerry Goldsmith liked to be referred to as, just a composer, and then composers write for ballet or film or opera. And so that's kind of the way I think of it anymore when someone's got that experience. Um, yeah, I agree, and Jerry's, Jerry's like one of my all-time heroes. He's like right at the top of that list for me, you know, when I think about um, who I admire as, a, as, a, as an artist, you know, him and Ennio Morricone, are just they're sort of the top of the pyramid for me and John Williams too, but um, you know it's funny you mention that because right now I'm actually working on early stages. You know I'm working on some concert music pieces, um, and I'm really excited about to be getting back to that because I, I you know our son just went off to college and I feel like there's maybe a little more space open up in my life to to sort of bring that back in. And I'm also a jazz trumpet player still, so I, I don't play out as much as I used to. I just simply can't. But I do all those things feed you as an artist, and I really. I believe it's important, um, you know, it's easy to get into a rut, especially in Hollywood. I mean, you become successful at one thing, they'll call you again and do it again and again, which is fine, you know, and I love what I do. But um, I, think, I think it's important as an artist to sort of make sure that, that, you, that, that I'm pushing my boundaries, that I'm putting myself in situations where, you know, it's not always easy, that I have to solve new problems, that I have to, um, you know, sort of stretch. Now, at the very beginning, or actually before the interview started, you mentioned that you can share with us what your next next big project is. <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 it's a little, it's, it's a little. I'll give you the scoop. So, um, <laughs> please, uh, th this is kind of a funny story, but you know, and it's just, it's only it's only you know the only asterisk I put on it is I just got the news yesterday, and in Hollywood terms, my deal is not signed yet, but I'm very <laughs> confident that'll happen. But it's. Um, it's a new series. You know, this is I, I. Part of the reason I went out of town. Well, the first reason I went out of town is that I, my wife and I were celebrating our 30th anniversary, and we love to travel, so we wanted to go out of town. The other reason I went out of town this particular time was that I didn't want to be in town for pilot season. <laughs> to be honest with you, <laughs> because I've done pilots, and they're you know I've gotten a lot of jobs off of pilots, but usually I've been like the second guy. Like whoever does a pilot immediately gets fired, or you know it's just it's it's a <laughs> it's a total pressure cooker of insanity. Like. I just, as Trevor Morris said to me yesterday, when we were talking, we were joking about this. He said, "Yeah, it's like all the stress and insanity of the TV business crammed into a two-week period, you know." And I just felt like I don't want to do that again, you know. And 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 also the other reason I didn't want to do it again is the the joy of doing House of Cards is we never did a pilot. We just jumped in and told the story. 
And the problem with pilots is that they're like these little sales presentations. Mm -hmm. So right. it's not really like you're making a movie. You're, so like all these, you, you think you write, a, you write a score and then almost it's like, well, the network doesn't like character C. He's unlikable. We better change all the music. So you end up making all these artificial choices, which have nothing to do with writing a good score. So anyways, long roundabout way of saying, I'm, I will tell you what I'm working on, but I'm excited about it because it's straight to series, which I think is a new thing that the networks are trying. It's like they realize the pilot sees pilot, the whole pilot model might be useful, but it's not as success. It's not always the best way to get something on the air. So, it's a new show, um, executive produced by Steven Spielberg for DreamWorks, starring Halle Berry, called Extent, which is a sci-fi drama that's going to be on CBS in the summer. And I'm really excited about it. It's a good show. It's a really cool story. It's 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 different. It's not. It's probably not as dark as House and Cards, but it's 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 got a lot of nice. Um, it's got a, it's um, what I look for selfishly as a composer is something that has a great role for the music, you know, it's, yeah. and, and, and just like house of cards, I'm excited about the musical possibilities of this show. It's really intriguing to me. Well, although I have yet to work personally with Steven Spielberg myself <laughs> I, or, or Halle Berry, right. Or Halle Berry, right. They're on my, you know, my list of future collaborations. Um, my understanding <laughs> is that Mr. Spielberg is very aware of the music and, even if it's not, say, John Williams, his normal musical collaborator, he's he's very hands on with video game music and television music. And I think that could be a lot of fun to have someone who cares that much about and, and may give you this wide palette. So I, and even if that wasn't the case, it sounds like a really cool project. Yeah, and we yeah. broke the news first. Thank you. No, I'm really excited about it. And, you know, <laughs> Stephen has a lot on his plate. And, and um, to be honest with you, I don't know how much we're going to have how much interaction we're going to have. But I can tell you in terms of the temping of the show, which sort of went through, he was very involved in the temping of the show and determining the tone. And he had a lot to say about that, you know, so it's exactly. And of course, you know, those notes are going to affect, you know, where I'm going to go. And, and it's going to be fun because it's always, always fun when you're working for somebody at the top of that sort of executive pyramid, who's, who's passionate about music and has such a great history with John of, a really beautiful, wonderful scoring, you know, so it's, it's, it's a, it's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. No, that's, yeah, that's very, very cool. Um, I did want to ask, this is really more of kind of like a gag question, but according to internet movie database, uh, your Emmy award winning main title for Monk was replaced in the second season by a Randy Newman song. And I'm not trying to bring up old, reopen old, movie, <laughs> but uh, I was going to ask, is that correct? And, because I actually never watched Monk, although I never I never watched it for its run. Is that correct? And do you bear any grudges? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I love Randy. Uh, Randy is amazing, and I'm a big fan of Randy's. Um, this this incident was really. It's I have no problem talking about it because it's just so funny. When I'll the story is just it's one of these Hollywood stories. It's it's filled. It's got layers of irony. You know, I, I, I got this job, I think around, it's, again, it was something that came out of, after I'd done Pollock, you know, uh, I, 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 was, I, I replaced a, a composer on the pilot for the show and did the first season, of this, worked with Dean Parasot, who's wonderful, and did the, did the theme and the, and the underscore, loved that show, and it became a huge hit. And, and this, around the second season, too, I thought, this is great. I mean, I was, I was maybe 30... 30, just turned 30 at the time, or 40, I'm sorry, and the decades, they just fly by when you're <laughs> my age. Um, no, I was, I was in my 30s, because, yeah, I just turned 50, so it was, you know. Anyways, long story short, you get to the end of the first season, I get this call from my agent, you know, oh, you know what, and I, and, and I had just opened, started my website, and, you know, fans were writing about this main title, I mean, it's kind of like what's happening with House of Cards, where people just, they really respond to the music, I'm here for my fans, and I knew, I just like, wow, these people love it. And I get this call from my agent, you know, the producer wants to change the theme music. I'm like going, are you kidding me? Wow. I was, I mean, I was just, you know, shocked. And, and um, I felt not betrayed by, by Randy. I mean, Randy's Randy. I mean, he, he, they, yeah. he's great. So, you know, I felt betrayed by the situation because they also fired me off the show. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and and that was that was a tough blow because I felt like I had really created something unique for this character. So the great sort of ironic ha ha, you know, fun of this story was that shortly after the the second season premiered with Randy's theme, which which was also which started generating a lot of controversy. To be to be honest with you, I got my first Emmy nomination, 
And a few months later, I won for that <laughs> main title, which wasn't on the show anymore. And in the process of being nominated and them trying some other musical approaches and realizing that it wasn't working, they rehired me back onto the show. So I had eight great seasons of a wonderful show. And, I, and I, one of the fun things about that show, I mean, is the, 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 the creators and the writers actually had a sense of humor about realizing either the mistake they made or how much people loved my theme. And there was actually a whole episode of Monk where Sarah Silverman stars, I think it was called Mr. Monk and the TV Star or something, but it's on Netflix. You can go watch this episode if you're, if you're really a film music geek because this is some fun inside humor. But she, Sarah Silverman plays a fan of, of a fictitious show, and this is a Monk episode, right, where they've, 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 they've changed her favorite theme song and she brings a petition up to be signed. And this is exactly what happened. I mean, some kid you know, <laughs> up, started a petition like, bring Jeff's theme back. It's so much better. You know, so <laughs> it turned out to be a great story. But here's, here's one, of the, one point I want to make, not to disparage Randy, because, again, Randy's great. But, but to defend my work and why people liked it and why I think it was the better of the two themes for that show. Um, and I, I can't make any value judgments about songs because Randy's a genius at what he does, and I can never write a Randy Newman song. And his song for Monk is great. But you know, somebody said something really great in the sort of in the sort of compare and contrast bake off of the two themes, and they said, and and, and I wrote an instrumental piece that was sort of in the style of Django Reinhardt. It had this sort of old timey feeling, and it was acoustic guitar. And he said, well, Monk's a neat, tidy guy. And this piece of music is neat and tidy, just like Monk. And you listen to it. If you, if you were a musicologist, you could look at this theme. It's like ev all, everything is just, there's a symmetry to it and a rhyme to it where it's like, it's just like Monk. Everything is just like, there's an architecture in that piece of music that's just very OCD, right? When you think about Randy Newman's songs and his singing, it's like, there's nothing tidy about that. And he's like, I love, but he's like New Orleans. He's like, oh, you know, he's like swallowing his words and blah, he's like, I mean, I picture, Rand, I picture Monk being in the same room with somebody like, uh, like that and just going, ah, germs, you know? <laughs> so, um, that, but, and also, another interesting compare and contrast, as long as we're talking about this, because it's, it's, uh, it's something I can laugh about now, of course, and enjoy. And, um, but, you know, it's, there's an the interesting compare and contrast between a piece of instrumental music and a piece with lyrics. And, and it was, it's a shame that, that I mean, I, and I, I love theme songs with lyrics. I mean, think of Gilligan's Island or whatever, you know, like a theme song with a great lyric can really stick with you. But also an instrumental theme can, can, can hit a different part of your brain and stick with you in exactly the same way and have a, it, it, and, and have a very resonant um, connection with an audience. So I think the fact that an instrumental piece was at least beloved, if not more beloved, than a song by America's master of songwriting tells you that just the a power of a good instrumental theme can be, you know, and, and it, it's nice to see, at least on cable and YouTube and, 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 and um, that, that, that theme, the theme song sequences are still surviving and, and being used by, by shows. Yeah. All right. That, that, that's, I, I really like that, the comparison of the two things that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, you know, Jeff, thank you very much for, taking some time to, to speak with us. Uh, it's been great getting to talk to you about House of Cards and Black Vision and all this, this kind of stuff. Uh, if you could, do you know when the House of Cards Season 2 soundtrack is going to be released? Uh, yeah, we had some artwork updates. It's all mastered. Um, I think it's coming out. I think we're, sh we're, we're, we're shooting for May. You go, I don't have an exact date, but if, if, I think the pre-release is listed on Amazon. And okay. it's going to be similar CD and iTunes. We did. I think uh, Vares Saraban has just released. There was a little. There were some little changes in the in the theme music for season two, so you can actually buy in iTunes today um, the season two main title music, which is available on iTunes, and it's also a bit of an extended version. I added some other material um, to that, so it's about about a three minute track. Of, if you're really a hardcore House of Cards fan and you want to buy that and compare and comp contrast, looks uh, like uh, May nineteenth. On Amazon. Thank you. May uh, okay. There Great. we go. A any, anything else coming out that you would like to mention while we're here? Uh, well, I'm just really excited about season three. You know, I, I, read, I read the Bible of storylines, and I just, <laughs> I can't say anything, but I, 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 <laughs> no, I do you can. know. It's, it's, it's okay. Okay, yeah. Well, here's yeah, what yeah, happens. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> dies. Okay. <laughs> no, um, Spoiler alert. Oh, no, 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 no. But, 
I, we didn't know if we were going to have a third season when we finished, when I finished composing the second season. And again, I won't say what happens at the end of the season two, but when you see where Kevin Spacey's and Robin Wright's characters end up at the end of season two, you really want, I, as a viewer, as a, as a fan, you know, of the show, thought, oh boy, we're in a whole other world. I really want to see what they're going to do now, you know? Yeah. So I'm really thrilled that they're, we're going to get to stay with these characters. It's a really, really amazing um, group of people. I mean, you look at these actors, Kevin and Robin, they are just incredible. Yeah, that's really exciting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to season three. That's, that's, that's good to know. Okay. So Jeff, thanks again. Um, it's it's been really great chatting with you. Hopefully, we can have you on the show again sometime. The next time you have something coming out that you'd like to talk about, we'd love to have you. Uh, yeah, it's been really great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, guys. My pleasure. Good talking with you. Thanks again to Jeff Beal for that great interview. Uh, I've got, as I mentioned at the top of the show, just one plug I want to mention before we go here. Uh, for those of you listening in the Los Angeles area, uh, there is an event coming up. May 3rd at 6 p.m. It's called Movie Night with Helix Collective. Helix Collective is this Los Angeles-based uh, chamber ensemble. And they've, they're they putting together this concert, which they uh, basically they had uh, filmmakers submit some short films and then had different composers compose a score to each of the short films. And at this concert, they will be performing the scores live, which will be kind of a neat thing. Um, and one of which was written by me, which is why I mention it. So if you're in the area and you want to check out a performance of some brand new scores performed live to picture, um, there you go. Movie night with Helix Collective, May 3rd, 6 p.m. at the Silver Lake Lounge in Los Angeles. I will not be there as I am 2,000 miles away, but if you're there, please enjoy. All right, cool. Well, that will do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. You can listen to us on soundnotion.tv slash SAP, where you can subscribe to the show, leave comments, and find links to the music we spoke about. You can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. My name is Bill Witham. And I am Kevin Wilt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.